Good morning and welcome home to Grace Avenue United Methodist Church. It's wonderful to see you and be with you on this incredibly beautiful snowy day. Uh, you know, 11 months ago, we wouldn't have known how to handle this. We would have thought to ourselves, how are we going to get out to people and people can't get to the church? And it almost would have been a day in which we just would have said, well, everything's kind of called off. But the reality of it is we've now learned how to come into your place wherever you are and to be able to share with you in a time of worship. And so today, that's what we've done. Uh, we're not having anyone in person today, but obviously there are hundreds of devices that are tuned in today to what we're doing here at Grace Avenue United Methodist Church. And we are so grateful that you have joined us uh, on this snowy, cold morning. Uh, we're coming together today to talk uh, about our uh, last part of our series that we've been doing called Common Good. And today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that I think is familiar to most people um, from 1 Corinthians 13. But we may be looking at it in a little bit different way today. So it is so wonderful to be together. Thank you for allowing us to come in to your space wherever you are this morning. I hope you're staying warm. It is a great day for you to have some hot chocolate or coffee, be in the warmth of your home, and for us to be connected by the Holy Spirit. Happy Valentine's Day. We send our love from here to you, and we are also extremely thankful. I just want to say a word of thanks we're very fortunate that we have a team that lives really close to the church. And so we were all able to get here. So Bill and Lori Hanson Roberts are here, and we're thrilled to have them with us. And Sep Young is with us. Um, Lawson made it home from Oklahoma City University. So we're thrilled that he um, made it home safely and is now with us for the week. And then Jeff Schnabley made it from his home not too far away. And then Preston Reed, who continues to help pull everything together. And so so good to be here with you. As we gather, we are mindful that there are many of you who are maybe feeling a little more isolated today because we now really need to not be out on the roads. If you need something, if there are groceries or things or we don't want you to be getting out. Um, the roads were okay, but they're going to get worse throughout the day. And so please let us know if there's a pastoral need you have, if there are other needs. My email is laura at graceavenue.org. Even though the offices will be closed, know that you can reach out to us and we will respond to you and we will be able to help connect you with someone who maybe can help you during this time. We don't want anybody to be out in the cold right now. We don't want any Anybody to be without food or without some basic needs that they have. So know that as a church family, we'll continue to connect with one another in those ways. We're continuing to talk about the common good, and that's one of the ways that we do it is how we share in God's love together, reaching out to one another. And so we were putting out signs. We're not going to encourage anyone to go out and put out signs over the course of the next couple of days. And yet we know that we continue to lift up prayers of appreciation for all of those who are our essential workers who are out among us. Um, keep the signs. We'll be doing that later on once the weather clears off and we can continue that in the days ahead. We also canceled a few other things in terms of the community garden blessing and um, we have worked with the city of Plano. We know that they are providing shelter for all of those without a place to stay. And so we're not encouraging anybody to get out for breakfast tomorrow either. So there are just some things that we've shifted, but we want you to know that we continue to make sure that those who are in need of that sense of shelter or home that we continue to seek to provide. Our mission here at Grace Avenue is to eradicate homelessness in whatever form it presents itself. We believe everyone needs an emotional home, everyone needs a physical home, and everyone needs a spiritual home. And so as we share in that together, we continue to look towards the season of Lent that calls us in some new ways. And as we move towards the season of Lent, well, we had planned an outdoor service for um, Ash Wednesday. We don't think that's going to happen. So watch your emails, watch the information, and know that all of our experiences will be online for Ash Wednesday. And we continue now to hear from the ukulele choir as we begin to prepare for worship. So if you want to set up that video so that we can share that together, and then that will move us into our time of worship this morning. Yeah, so one of the great things that we continue to have is the opportunity to share in music in a variety of ways. And recently our ukulele choir got together and 
uh, have been putting together a series of different songs that we could use in worship, and we're so grateful for them under the direction of Bill Roberts. They're actually uh, in a, uh, uh, a time this uh, during the month of February in which they're uh, thinking about some music from the Beatles. And uh, this morning as we come together on this Valentine's Day, uh, I invite you to go ahead and light a candle now and prepare yourself for worship. Uh, go ahead and take your Bibles and open it to 1 Corinthians 13. Many of you are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13. You've probably heard it read before, maybe at a wedding, uh, maybe even at a funeral. Uh, it's one of those great passages in the Bible. We're going to look at that today. So go ahead and get 1 Corinthians ready. Light your candle and invite the light of Christ into uh, your presence today. And let's hear now from the Grace Avenue Ukulele Choir. Thank you, ukuleles. That was great. I can't think of a better day to sing about love. So our opening hymn this morning is How Can We Name a Love? So as you are able, stand wherever you are in body or spirit and let us sing together. If you would, take this time to pass the peace of Christ with those in your home or maybe send a text or an email and let those around you know that the peace of Christ is with them. And now 
I invite you to join Brittany Board, our children's minister for a time of, with children. Good morning, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Do you know what we celebrate on Valentine's Day? We celebrate love, love with our family, love with our friends, but most importantly, we remember how truly loved by God we are. Valentine's Day is another day that we can remember that we are all children of God and we are loved. To celebrate Valentine's Day today and to talk about how we all are connected and loved, I have a special book I wanna share with you. It's called The Invisible Streak. Liza and Jeremy, the twins, were asleep one calm and quiet night. Suddenly, it began to rain very hard. Thunder rippled until it got so loud that it woke them up. Mommy, mommy, they cried out as they ran to her. Don't worry, you two, it's just the storm making all that noise. Go back to bed. We want to stay close to you, said Jeremy. We're scared. Mom said, you know we're always together no matter what. But how can we be together when you're out here and we're in bed? said Liza. Mom held something right in front of them and said, this is how. Rubbing their sleepy eyes, the twins came closer to see what mom was holding. I was about your age when my mommy first told me about the invisible string. I don't see a string, said Jeremy. You don't need to see the invisible string. People who love each other are always connected by a very special string made of love. But if you can't see it, how do you know it's there? Asked Liza. Even though you can't see it with your eyes, you can feel it with your heart and know that you are always connected to everyone you love. When you're at school and you miss me, your, your love travels all the way along the string until I feel it tug on my heart. And when you tug it right back, we feel it on our hearts, said Jeremy. Does Jasper the cat have an invisible string, Liza asked. She sure does, said mom. And best friends like me and Lucy, asked Liza. Best friends too. How far can the string reach? Anywhere and everywhere, mom said. Would it reach me even if I were in a, a submarine? Captain deep in the ocean, asked Jeremy. Yes, mom said, even there. Or a mountain climber, even there. A ballerina in France, even there. A jungle explorer, even there. How about an astronaut out in space? Yes, even there. Then Jeremy quietly asked, can my stream reach all the way to Uncle Brian in heaven? Yes, even there. Does the stream go away when you're mad at us too? Never, said mom. Love is stronger than anger. And as long as love is in your heart, the stream will always be there. Even when you get older and can't agree about things like what movie to see or what game to play in the back seat or what time to go to bed, Oh, that's right, you should be in bed. And with that, they all laughed as mom chased the twins back to their beds. So I love this book, because this book not only helps us remember that we are all connected, and especially at a time like this, we don't get to see all of our family and all of our friends as much as we used to. So this book helps us remind that on this Valentine's Day, we are still connected through this invisible string called love. But it also reminds us that God loves us and that God is always with us. So I want you to close your eyes and say, I am a child of God and I am loved. Now let's pray. Dear gracious God, thank you so much for Valentine's Day and for always loving me. In Jesus name we pray, amen. Thank you, Brittany, for sharing that great story about the invisible string of love, that string that connects us all across the miles. Today we have a white rose on the altar and we remember the life of Gus Abenshine. 
We will celebrate Gus's life this coming Thursday, February the 18th at 11 o'clock a.m. through live stream from Stonebriar Funeral Home. And so you can go onto their website and find information and sign a guest book, reaching out to Jane, his wife, across the miles with an invisible string of love. We also continue to be mindful that this coming Saturday, we will be celebrating the life of Marianne Holcomb through the live stream at Grace Avenue. And that service is at two o'clock p.m. We know that there are prayer requests that you have on your heart today. We know that there are people that you are lifting up in prayer. We are mindful of those who may be out in the cold without shelter. We are mindful of those who may feel isolated and alone emotionally. And we are mindful and hold on our hearts those who are seeking that place of spiritual home as well. Let us know your prayer requests. There's a link online to be able to send those directly to us or you can email us, laura at graceavenue.org. Or you can put it in the chat today. But know that we are connected with you and that the prayers that we lift up, that God hears those prayers. But that each and every one of us are the people who can reach out with the hands and feet of Christ sharing God's love. How will you do that today for the common good? What prayers are on your heart? What needs might you have? How can we be community together? At this time, on this day where we are focused on the gift of love, may we open our hearts to the love of God, turning to God in prayer. Dear God, Because love is patient, help us to be slow to judge and quick to listen, hesitant to criticize and eager to encourage. Because love is kind, help our words to be gentle and our actions to be thoughtful. Because love does not envy or boast and is not proud, Help us to have hearts that are humble and to see the good in others. Because love is not rude or self-seeking, help us to speak words that are kind and truthful. Remind us that our world is full of needs and hurts. Because love is not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs, help us to forgive others and to reach out our hands in love. Because love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, help us to stand up for what is right and good. Because love always protects and always trusts, help us to be a refuge for those around us. When the world outside is harsh and cold, may our hearts be a place of acceptance and warmth. And because love always perseveres, help our hearts to always be filled with your love. Thank you for showing us what the word love really means. We praise and thank you, O God, for your relentless love, for its abundant availability, and for so flooding our lives that some must inevitably overflow and warm others with its touch. In the name of your Son, the best example of love, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I have become a man, I've put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God is love, for God so loved the world, the whole world, not just my world. God so loved every person in this world and sent Jesus to teach us what love looks like. L'amour est plein de bonté, l'amour. Et l'amour no es envidia. Liefde prompt niet. Любовь не гордится. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. To love every person, every nationality, every background, every history, every soul. Because in life, we find faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Well, it's been wonderful for these past three weeks to be thinking about how we share in the common good of our world, how we participate uh, as people of faith in the common good, how we're led by the, the love and the power of Jesus Christ uh, to, uh, uh, to be a part of the common good. We started by talking about the importance of this idea of the commonwealth and uh, we were reminded, uh, were reminded in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 that although all things may be permissible, not all things are beneficial. 
And uh, we talked about the importance of how we need to be able to see one another in uh, this commonality. Last week we talked about the common table and about uh, the importance of, of sharing our lives by sharing our gifts and understanding what those gifts are. But, but even more to the point, Paul tells us that we are part of the body of Christ and individually members of it. And how important it is for the church to be the body of Christ uh, and what that looks like potentially in the world. Um, today, as I said earlier, we've come to this uh, very uh, familiar passage, I think, to most of us uh, about uh, love. Uh, and it's used in a lot of different, in different contexts. One of the things that I think is most interesting about this passage as we start today is that it never mentions the word God and it never mentions the word Christ or Jesus. Uh, Paul sets this in the context of his work with the Corinthians. And, and in the midst of that, sometimes what happens is, is that we forget uh, the simple idea that, that God is love. God is the common good. And when we begin to work in that way, we work in the spirit of God and we, we share together in the spirit of God. Um, the kind of love that Paul talks about today is a very specific kind of love that I think is very important for us to hear on Valentine's Day, but also to hear it for what it is on Valentine's Day. And that may be a something a little bit different uh, than how we normally celebrate. So let's celebrate today. Let's talk one more time about the common good and the common ground that we share, the common ground of love. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, inspire us with your true and lively word that we may know more of what it means to be your children, that we may faithfully respond to the call of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one in whose name we've gathered and the one in whose name we pray. Amen. One of my earliest childhood memories is sitting in front of of what is called a Snellen chart. Have you ever sat in front of a Snellen chart? I bet you have. It's, it's that poster that you see often in a doctor's office or more op, often even in an optometrist's office. Now we look through lenses to see it, but it's that chart that has a big E at the top of it. It's a, a chart that is designed to test your vision and it's named for a man named Herman Snellen. He was an optometrist uh, working in his field long back in uh, the 1860s. And he developed this chart to be able to, to have a categorical way of measuring people's vision, how good your vision was, 2020 or 2040, or in my case, much greater than that. I sat in front of that Snellen chart, and, and, and I was so young that I had not even uh, been able to read yet. So as I sat in front of the Snellen chart, it was not a chart that simply had a bunch of different letters and numbers on it. It only had one letter on it, that great big E. And then as you moved down the chart, the E was turned in different directions. It was turned downward, or it was turned on its side, or it was pointing to the left, or pointing to the right. And the reason they did that was because I, didn't, I hadn't been able to read yet. I, I, I didn't know how to read yet, and I didn't identify all the letters yet. In order for them to get the test right, what I did was, is as they went down the chart, they would ask me to point in the direction that the E was facing. So as I went down the chart, I would point this way, and then I'd see another one, and I would point this way, and then I would point this way, and then I would point that way. And of course, as we got down the chart, it didn't take long to realize that I had a very severe form of myopia. Myopia. At a very young age, I was diagnosed with the difficulty of nearsightedness. I could see things up close, but I couldn't see things that were far away. And if someone has 20-20 vision, I think at a very early age, my, my vision was 20-60 or 20-80. And it progressively got worse as I grew up. This is not uncommon. Many of us have suffered through myopia. Many of us have been fitted for prescription lenses. 
And we know the experience of having had an examination in front of a Snellen chart. Well, the reason I bring that up is because I think that's exactly what Paul is doing today in 1 Corinthians. Uh, The letter to 1 Corinthians is really a vision exam uh, that he was giving to the church at Corinth. Uh, He's checking in on all of these different things and he he finally comes down to uh, to the conclusion, to the diagnosis, to the diagnosis that the Corinthian church has myopia. They're living with a kind of nearsightedness, or even worse, they're living with a kind of short-sightedness. What some people would even refer to as selfishness. They saw everything within the context of how it suited them. Uh, they, they, they saw everything in the context of, of how it would benefit them. And, and in the midst of that, they, they started having conflict at a, at a very uh, uh, severe degree. Uh, they were fighting over so many things. Whose gifts were the most important and which teachers were really the ones that were most prominent. And, and, and the more they fought, the more they lived into this conflict, the more short-sighted or nearsighted they became. Paul said to them, you need to have a corrective lens. And that corrective lens comes today in 1 Corinthians 13. We have to read 1 Corinthians 13 in the context of these other chapters that were about conflict. Paul says, this is the corrective lens that God gives to you. What would it be like if you began to see everything through the lens of love? That's a good question. What would it be like if we began to see everything and then practice everything through the lens of love? Because the reality of what we know right now in our world is that we are continuing to live even now with a very severe case of myopia. I cannot remember a time in our culture where we have been more short-sighted about some things or more nearsighted about things in which we have said to ourselves, the only thing that matters is what's close to me. The only thing that matters is what's around me. One of the reasons that we showed the video just a moment ago is because it gives this clear understanding that if God is love, God's love is not just for me. God's love is for the world. And we need to be able to to see love as this thing that permeates far beyond our parochial needs, far beyond kind of the inner circle of what we want and we desire. And so today, Paul, Paul puts us back in front of that chart with those big E's on it. And he invites us to understand that love is the prescriptive lens that we need in our life. It is the gift from God that permeates everything we do. We need to be clear, though, from the beginning today. We're not talking about some kind of rose-colored glasses that God puts upon us. Instead, we are talking about something that sharpens our vision and then also dictates our behavior and our action. We sit in front of this chart today, and as we, as we test our vision this morning, we think about the gift of love, and we begin to realize that, that first and foremost today, when we read this passage in 1 Corinthians 13, we see that love is essential. Love is essential. That's, uh, in, you know, we find that sometimes when we, uh, when we eat food. If you've ever eaten anything that was missing the essential ingredient, you know how inedible it actually is, right? That moment where you taste something and you go, okay, this is missing the key ingredient. Well, that's so true about love. Paul talks about that in terms of spiritual gifts. He's just come out of that chapter in 12 where he's talking to the Corinthian church. And, and, and he says to them, look, you, you can have the ability to speak in tongues. You may have the ability to, to offer great prophecy. You may even have faith enough to move a mountain. You may even have the capacity to, to, to serve in a way that you might, might be able to, uh, to, to give over everything that you have. 
But if you are missing the essential ingredient of love, you have nothing. What a powerful statement that is. Without the essential nature of love in our lives, none of our gifts matter. None of our talents matter. None of our abilities matter. Love is this essential ingredient which is so crucial to how we live for and with the common good. I am so grateful that for the last several weeks we've been celebrating our essential workers. I just just love that term to think about. You know, there are people uh, who are who 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 are beyond their myopic view of the uh, of the world, and they're willing to say to themselves, "What matters is how I live for the common good." And so we think about those people. Even today, on a day like today, when we all say everybody's got to stay in, all of us know already there are people that can't stay in today. There are firefighters and there are police officers and there are hospital workers. And, and, and in the broader context of our community, there are teachers and there are grocery store workers and there are people that provide transportation for our goods and our services And it is so important for us to think about that in terms of this context of love. We we know that love is essential. None of those workers, I dare say today, could do their job if they didn't have at least some kind of concept of love in their life. Love for their community, love for their country, love for their family, love for the world and the created order that God has made. But thank God for those essential workers in our lives, not only for what they provide for us, but because they remind us of this very important fact from the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13, love is essential. But then go back and sit in front of that chart again. Test your vision one more time. And as you look at that big E again today, you realize that love is effective. Yeah, I mean, in so many respects, love is practical. And, and in so many respects, it's uh, uh, something that, that we relate to in a very important way. You know, we talk all the time about best practices. I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, whatever it is you do in the world, you want to know what are some of the best practices for the things that I participate in? What are, what are the methods that are most effective? What are the treatments when we're ill that are most effective? What are the things that bring about the most effective results? Well, you know what? Love is the most effective thing we have in the world. The most effective treatment there is in the world, the most effective result that can be uh, attained in the world is through love. And Paul gives us this list this morning. He reminds us that you know, love is patient and love is kind and love is not jealous or envious or boastful or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Now we probably need to take a step back at this point and remember Uh, That in English, we only have one word for love. In Paul, uh, in the language that he was using, they they knew at least three words for love. They knew eros, uh, from which we get the word erotic, which is is the word for romantic love. And then there was the word phileo. Phileo, of course, we know the name Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's the love that is mutual between friends. But the word that Paul uses here that is very unique to our Christian context is the word agape. That is the word that Paul uses in this list. And that's how he says the, uh, when he talks about the effective nature of love, the effective nature of love comes about through this agape love, the love that God shows us. This unconditional love, this love that absolutely is defined as being for the common good, the kind of love that is for everyone. Paul gives us this list of effective love. You know, when you think about it, 
You think about what are, what, are, what are some of the symbols that we have for love. And I know that on a day like today, on Valentine's Day, we look at all these things that are sweet and sentimental, a, a box of chocolates or a bouquet of flowers, and we think that's the symbol of love. That could not be further from what Paul is talking about here. As important as it is at times to be sentimental, what Paul is talking about in this moment has nothing to do with being sentimental. When Paul says that love is patient and love is kind and love is not jealous or envious or boastful or rude, he's not thinking about flowers and boxes of chocolate. He's not thinking about Valentine's Day. He's thinking about the most effective thing in the world. You want to affect change in this world? Then practice love. You see, that's, that's the problem is that we've, we, we so often have, have bought into these things that we think are a quick fix. And so instead of seeing love as the most effective thing, we think, well, blaming others is the most effective thing. Or, 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 or complaining about things is the most effective thing. Or promoting ourselves is the most effective thing. And whereas those things may have some kind of short-term effectiveness, they cannot compare in the long run to the effectiveness of love. It's about love pulling together. Now, you know, I think a, a, a better, a, a much better symbol for love uh, would be something that we find uh, out of African culture. There's this wonderful symbol in African culture that is called the tabono. Tabono uh, is an Adinka word that actually means or, a paddle. It, it is the symbol of, of perseverance. It is the symbol of resilience. It is the symbol of purposefulness and strength. Tabono. And the word literally means an oar. Why would it be an oar? Why is that so important? Well, if you've ever been in a boat with another person, you know why that's an effective symbol. It's because if you've ever been in a canoe or you've ever been in a boat and they have a paddle and you have a paddle, if you're not working in the same direction, if you're not working together, it's a disaster. One of my favorite books in the whole world is a book that was written several years ago called The Boys in the Boat. And the uh, subtitle of the book is uh, Nine Americans and Their Epic Quest for Gold at the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. It is. That's the story of it. It's about these nine young men, most of whom were from Washington State, and in particular, it's the story of this one man and how he got involved in crewing and rowing. And eventually, he, he worked his way because it's very hard work. It's very competitive. And eventually, this team made it all the way through the American trials to the Olympic Games in Berlin. And, and it's just this amazing story. And, and they even talk about the boat and, the, and, and how important it is. But they talk about the oars. They talk about the fact that the very water that supports you is the resistance and how you work through that. But you only work through that together. There's this amazing quote in the book in which there's a description when they finally get to the Olympic Games. They talk about that all on the team were merged into one smoothly working machine they were, in fact, a poem in motion, a symphony of swinging blades. Love is effective. Imagine what this world would we be like if we were a symphony of swinging blades. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or envious or boastful or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
the church has the opportunity to be a symphony of swinging blades, a poem of motion. And when that happens, we recognize once again that the most effective thing in the world in the short term and in the long term is love. It's more than sentimental boxes of chocolates and bouquets of flowers. And that's really, I think, what we celebrate on this Valentine's Day. The love that is enduring, the love that is resilient, the love that is, is, is passionate and strong, the love that perseveres. Love is effective. But we go back one more time, and as we check our vision today, we look at that chart and see that big E one more time, and we remind ourselves that love is eternal. Love is eternal. You know, it's one of the hard facts of life to have to think about. But one of the things we come to the realization of is that every material thing we have in this world every material thing that we own in this world will one day be gone. Not, not just because we are gone, but, but, but because those things will be gone. Those things ultimately don't last. I don't care whether it's your house or whether it's your car or whether it's some other kind of keepsake or possession. Eventually, one day, all those things are gone. And we ask ourselves, what remains? Paul asks that question at the end of the scripture today and it's such a beautiful way to bring it all together because he, he reminds them about all these other things again these spiritual gifts that eventually cease tongues will come to an end and prophecies will come to an end but there's something that does not come to an end there's something that remains and it's the gift of love love is eternal and, and, and right now, Paul says, we only see it in part. But there will come a time when we will see the fullness of love. And when we see the fullness of love, we will be reminded once again that God is love. And therefore, love is eternal. I don't know about you, but I want to attach my life to the things I know that are eternal. And love is this beautiful gift from God. Now, sometimes it's really difficult to love. I mean, we need to be honest about that today as well. Sometimes we get into situations or we come across people and we just think, I, I just can't love this person. I'm having a difficult time in the midst of this. Or, or sometimes we've had our hearts broken. I mean, that's part of our stories as well. And, and, and we think about, you know, I, I loved and I, I leaned into love and then something failed or something happened or I lost someone. It, it's, it's not uncommon in the midst of our love to, to know the experience of having a broken heart. But Paul reminds us today of something that is so important Henry David Thoreau, the great author and poet in the middle part of the 1800s, said something one time that I think is so important in terms of this part of the conversation. Henry David Thoreau said, There is no remedy for love but to love more. There is no remedy for love but to love more. Today, if you're suffering from a broken heart. What I want to say to you is that God's love, the agape that is mentioned in this scripture today, is so amazing and so powerful and so transforming that it allows us, even in the midst of our brokenness, to love more. There is no remedy for love but to love more. We sit in front of a vision chart today and we dream about a world in which the common good 
is shared by all. And the common good which benefits all. And today we are fitted once again for these amazing lenses that remind us of love. The love today that is essential. The love today that is effective. And the love today that is eternal. Paul finishes with those great words from 1 Corinthians 13. Now these three things abide, faith and hope and love. Bishop Michael Curry of the Episcopal Church says that that faith is the wind and hope is the sails that catch the wind. But love is the rudder that steers the ship. Now these three things remain, faith and hope and love. And the greatest of these, the most essential of these, the most effective of these, and the most eternal of these is love. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to stand where you are as you are able. Let us join in professing our faith using a modern affirmation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Please be seated. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love. In the service of love. And so at this time, we offer our gifts. We offer our gifts that extend into our community. And so I invite you during this time to prayerfully consider what you might offer today so that God's love, God's love reaches out from from our community of faith into the greater community and into the world. You can offer your gifts by texting to give, by going online to the link that's there. You can mail your gift in this week, but know that for the first couple of days of this week for the common good, we are gonna encourage you not to bring your gifts by to the church. The offices will be open later in the week. The entry areas will be reopened. The Grace on the Go trailer will be reopened, all to receive your donations. But for now, the great gift is from the warmth of your home. You can still offer gifts to God and know that they are being used for the common good.
every day. So many heartaches that pierce the soul. So much pain that won't ever go away. How do we make it better? How do we make it through? What can we do when there's nothing we can do? Inside, we all need the same things. Maybe we'll find if we are there for each other that together we'll weather not ever tomorrow may to make things right then what are we really fighting for does nobody want to see it does nobody understand the power to heal is right here in our hands we can be take care of each other we can remember that deep down inside we all need the same things and maybe we'll find if we are there for each other that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow may bring it's not enough to talk about it, not enough to sing a song. We must walk the walk about it, you and I, do or die, we've got to try. We all need the same things, and maybe we'll find if we are there for each other that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow may bring. And maybe. of mind if we always remember we can be Our closing song this morning is they'll know we are Christians by our love. So would you stand as you are able in body or spirit as we sing together. Bye. 
questions by our love. Yes, indeed, they will know we are Christians by our love. Uh, it's been wonderful to be together today. I hope that you stay warm. I hope that you stay dry. And I hope that wherever life takes you this week, you find your way back onto Grace Avenue. We look forward to the beginning of the season of Lent, which will happen this Wednesday, where there is once again a 90% chance of snow. So we will not, I can guarantee you, we will not be having an outdoor uh, Lenten uh, Ash Wednesday experience, but we will have an experience at 12 noon and one at 7 p.m. online. Please join us as we begin. And then next week, we start our brand new series uh, the Lenten series, The Way of Christ, and we'll be talking about the temptation of Christ next week. And so we invite you to come and be a part of that uh, and uh, look forward to that time together. Uh, go forth today now with this blessing. Go forth with, in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, now and forevermore. Amen.